My name is Steve Bloomfield, and I want to welcome you all here. And I want to thank uh, Patty Anthony for helping to organize this, and Dr. Landoffy and the other organizers for asking me to come talk. And I hope that some of the other um, chances to uh, hear other people talk were both engaging as well as informative. Uh, and any time, I hope to uh, field any questions that you might have. Uh, my name is Steve Bloomfield, and as a neurosurgeon, I've been challenged with helping to engage in an evaluation of patients with brain tumors inside their brains. And we spend a good deal of time trying to figure out how to help educate patients as well as how to, when appropriate, operate on patients who have brain tumors in a manner that would minimize the side effects and maximize the removal of the tumor itself. So what I'm hoping to do today is I'm hoping to describe how we have used technology to improve brain tumor resections with outcomes that are improving in terms of minimal side effects and maximal resection of the tumor to help people live longer uh, and with a better quality of life. And so the advances of neuronavigation, like a GPS system, is something that I'm going to help describe how I went through my 35 years of experience so far to be able to bring it to where we are now. And hopefully our uh, progress will not halt. It will continue to improve. Uh, first, my hero was Wilder Penfield. And in 1954, he was bestowed upon him the Nobel Prize for medicine because of his work mapping the functional areas of the brain in patients in an effort to remove seizure foci to help people with intractable seizures have a functional life and live long uh, without the odious fear of having another seizure. And he said something very interesting that really resounded in me as a young medical student and as a uh, resident in training in neurosurgery. And he said that a good surgeon is trained in his craft during his apprenticeship and later in the practical school of operative experience. He soon learns that technique is a thing that he must alter progressively as greater understanding comes to him. So I believe that this was a message that we all need in medicine uh, to be able to take to heart and to constantly upgrade our abilities and to help the concept of standing on the shoulders of my forebears and having people stand on our shoulders so that the horizon could be more expansive and we could do better for you and your colleagues uh, and patients and uh, everyone involved who are stricken with a uh, loved one or themselves who have a diagnosis of a brain tumor. Um, so I'm going to talk about how we have developed technology to understand the brain, um, in addition to understanding the anatomy and physiology of the brain, we're understanding the brain in individual patients. Uh, functional MRI scanning localized the functional zones of the cortical surface. Then we started to understand better the location of the fiber tracts that connect these eloquent areas of the cortical surface in what we call DTI tractography, identifying the functional tracts that are near the tumor. And then it enables us to assess the risks of the surgery, expand the limits of our operability, and counsel patients and families in deciding whether or not an operation should be undertaken as well as how aggressive to be in that surgery and what the goals would be in a realistic manner, giving a good sense of balance of risks and benefits to help guide them. We also use this technology to create a preoperative plan that we could identify going into the surgery to identify the exact location of the tumor, the optimal trajectory to get to the tumor, and what I call defining the no-fly zones that we want to avoid. And I'll give you some examples of that. In order to do this, we require a team of people, and I should have added to this the engineers of the people who developed some of this technology. But we have people like Dr. 
uh, Landoffian neuro-oncology, our neurosurgery team, our neuroradiologists, because this is technology that requires a great deal of computerization with imaging, as you'll see, as well as neuropsychologists and neuro-ophthalmologists to help us fully understand the impact of the tumor upon a patient's brain function and their quality of life, as well as help us be able to not only predict what influence our surgical procedure may have on a person's function of the brain and their quality of life, but also create a plan for remediation. In other words, create a plan of rehabilitation to be able to help minimize whatever impact of brain function these tumors in our surgeries may have, to minimize that impact upon a person's functional capabilities and quality of life. Um, so I'm going to start talking about this. Um, first, I'm going to talk about the areas of vision. Then I'm going to talk about the somatosensory, the motor control centers. And then I'm going to talk about the speech and language centers to give you an idea of how we apply these technologies to the uh, um, individual patients when brain tumors are close to these areas. So in patients who have tumors in the occipital lobes, which are in the back part of the brain, you have the risk of having visual field cuts, difficulty recognizing what objects are, like a toothbrush or a comb or a fork, which makes it difficult for people to actually function because if they want to eat, they don't want to pick up a toothbrush, they'd like to pick up a fork. Um, difficulty recognizing people's faces, knowing who people are. Um, family members or friends, difficulty reading and writing, um, and also a neglect syndrome which can be present when people could still see things, but they just don't pay attention to those things that they see in certain parts of their vision. So these sorts of potential problems need to be minimized and avoided if at all possible. In 1982 to 1987, when I was in my training, we were introducing the intraoperative microscope with very nice techniques to be able to see where the tumors are in the brain was that we were operating on. We'd have MRI scans on the view boxes to have an idea, and we have a basic sense of anatomy that we were drilled into us in medical school and in our residency training program, understanding where certain eloquent cortex should be located in each individual. But we were kind of winging it in terms of applying what we think should be to each individual patient, and everyone's an individual, and each patient has enough individuality that may make some of those assumptions uh, fall short and not foolproof. So over here, this yellow area here winds up being what we think of as the average patient's visual field uh, cortex called the calcarine cortex, which processes visual information. And then next door to it in the gray areas of 8 and 15, right off to the right side, are visual association areas. So we have the sense that in the yellow areas, we see a letter on a page that we're reading. In the association areas, we recognize that that form is a letter. And then it gets transmitted to other areas that I'll show you in a moment, where we take that letter, put it with other letters, and form a word, and even link words together to form a phrase and put that into our speech centers through fiber tracks that connect to them to help us be able to figure out what we're reading and then even read it back or create um, responses to what we're reading that are appropriate. Now let's see if that works. Good. So our anatomy shows us that to the areas where we interpret our vision in the calcarine cortex, we have fiber tracks that go from the deep part of the center of the brain around a curve and get to the location in the calcarine cortex in an indirect manner. And this type of approach to anatomy helps us know that tumors in this area of the brain 
are going to have problems causing visual field cuts to patients. Or if there's a tumor here, and this pointer's not working that well, but if there's a tumor over here, that if we take a operative course through this path to get to it, we're going to cut these fiber tracks and cause a visual field cut. So we need to learn where they're supposed to be and how to avoid them. So we have anatomical maps that show us where these fiber tracks are in our minds. And we have these maps that are placed into the MRI scan planes so that when we have a patient with an MRI scan with a tumor, we can make a reasonable assumption where the tumor sits in relationship to these fiber tracks. So up until 1987, we were winging it with this type of information, doing reasonably well, but not as well as we could do. So we started bringing these presumed atlases of the average patient in their fiber tracks into the MRI scans and overlaying it where the tumors would be. And we even created 3D models that would help us identify the cortex of interest and the fiber tracks connecting them. And we would use then stereotactic techniques that would help us identify a three-dimensional target where the tumor was and we would understand where the target would be and with a special apparatus placed on the head we would be able to bring a probe right down to that target where the tumor is and it would give us a trajectory to the tu tumor and we would with the atlases try to figure out the safest trajectory to minimize injury to the optic radiations, those fiber tracks that we need to avoid cutting. In 1987 to 1994, we were able to accurately direct therapeutic instruments to these target volumes in three-dimensional space. But this frame, as you could see, sometimes gets in the way. So we, in the 90s, we were able to create resections like this, a tumor here, in here to resect it like so, but not all of the time were we able to do it as successfully because of some of the impediments of this frame in the way. So we developed frameless neural navigation systems in the early 1990s, which had the same or close to the same accuracy as the frame-based systems, and it eliminated the need for a patient to have a frame placed on their head before the surgery started. Um, and there was no impediment to the surgical corridor. We also developed more MRI scan anatomical atlases. And this is an example of a neural navigation system in the operating room where these probes that we would use would be registered into the actual um, computer with the MRI scans data showing where the patient, actual patient's brain is and their brain tumor. And wherever we touched the probe, it would show up in the computer like a divining rod going hot or cold. We would be able to help guide where the incision should be, help guide where the opening in the skull would be, and help guide the entry site in the surface of the brain, as well as the trajectory and depth to get to the target. So you see how this probe, this may not be that easy to see, you put a probe on the surface and it comes up here, here and here in three different views, and then a three-dimensional view shows you where you are in relationship to the patient's brain seen through the MRI scan. And it also shows where the tumor is. Um, around 2000, we started to use functional MRI scans. This took it up a big notch because prior to this, we assumed where people would have their eloquent cortex based on data that was averaging a lot of patients and a lot of animal research as well. And so everyone is an individual. Sometimes a person's motor cortex is one gyrus forward or back compared to another individual. So this helped us out a great deal. And it helped us by adjusting the surgical trajectory regarding the actual function of the patient. So in an MRI scanner, a person 
would activate the visual cortex by seeing things or activate the motor cortex by moving a hand or activate a language function cortex by having a language drill that they would say over again by either reading, writing, or having object recognition of objects that they would name. So this type of, of process of activating the surface of the brain became very interesting. And in the beginning, it was a little crude, but it's getting better and better. And I'll show you. Here's an activation of the occipital cortex with vision. And it goes into the mapping of the MRI scans to be able to help us during our neuro navigation. Here's another one, but this is actually activating the visual association areas, the areas that take the image of a letter and recognize that it's the letter T, or recognize that this round circle with a little depth is a ball, as an example. Okay, so then in 2004 to 2006, we started to develop this concept of, okay, we know the surface of the brain, no-fly zones, but what about the no-fly zones in the depths of the brain that are due to the fiber tracks connecting these important structures on the surface of the brain, like those optic radiations? So I'm going to try to do something here for a moment. Here's a fancy little movie showing how fiber tracks can be imaged with special MRI scan techniques. Similar to any MRI scan that you go to, but the MRI scan techniques could see the fiber tracks in three-dimensional space. And we have learned how to pair out the fiber tracks that are important nearby the area where the patient's tumor is. And I'll show you nice pictures of that. Okay, so here we have an MRI scan with, of the patient with the fiber track of the optic radiations showing in three-dimensional space where it actually exists for this individual patient. And here's another view with it in orange. And here, looking at the MRI scan slice, you see where the orange areas of the fiber tract is, and sometimes the fiber tract bows a little and goes out of that plane, and so we want to know exactly in each plane where it's located and a three-dimensional map of it could be identified as well in different views. And we see that the fiber tracks, for instance, go very close to a structure called the ventricle, and this is where those fiber tracks are. So we could get close to the ventricle up above it or below it, but we can't get close to the ventricle in that location where those fiber tracks are. And you can see, again, fiber tracks near that structure called the ventricle. Okay, now I'm not going to get too much into this slide because it's not that important except to point out a few things. First is that as we went from non-stereotactic to frame-based resections, we started to be able to improve our percentage of resection of the tumor from 75 to about 90 percent. Then when we went to frameless, we improved it a little bit more but not, not that much more. Functional MRI and DTI has not helped us remove more tumor, except what it has done is it has helped us to say that we could operate on some patients more likely than not when we find that the information from the functional MRI and DTI show us that the tumor is located outside of these eloquent cortical surfaces and outside of the fiber tracks that we're concerned about. So in essence, uh, we really have been able to help more patients, though each patient, the chances of getting all of the tumor out or the percentage of tumor removal stays around the same, about 95%. Um, so with that in mind, I've also found that patients with metastatic tumors, as you could sense here, from the data from our DTIs, you know, the tractography, is that the metastatic tumors push the fiber tracks away, whereas the gliomas are more invasive and tend, on the whole, to invade the fiber tracks. And these are bits of information that we have to know before recommending surgery or have to know and help us identify what the risks of an operation would be, for instance. 
Um, so the optimal trajectory to a tumor is not always the shortest route. And I'm just going to show you from an impression of using this technology that a tumor like here, if we went this way into the tumor, would have destroyed fiber tracks coming around and it would cause a visual field cut to be worse than it was pre-op. And I'll show you the images of the fiber tracks. Here's an example of a tumor that's based right in this area of the brain and the fiber tracks being pushed out or at least separated by enough of a space that we could go into this tumor from a more medial midline approach with a trajectory that would spare these fiber tracks and be able to help a patient have improvement in visual field function after surgery um, instead of having worsening visual field function. Here's another view of the same thing, showing the tumor and the fiber tract separate, and you could see the kind of resection we could have in this kind of a tumor and have visual fields improve. Okay, and I'm gonna to go to the motor cortex. The motor cortex gives us a problem because we have the risks of having weakness and paralysis that is very important in our quality of life and function. And typically, the primary motor cortex is weakness. There's a supplementary motor cortex in the midline that I'll show you more anterior to the motor cortex that is involved with an apraxia, which is a patient who can still move things, but has difficulty carrying out goal-oriented behavior, such as they're able to move their hand and their arm like this, but give them a toothbrush and ask them to show me how you brush your teeth, they can't do it. And so functional mapping has been very helpful with our neuro navigation systems and the technology of the functional MRI for the surface of the brain where the cortex is. We could even identify where the supplementary motor cortex is with this technology. And we could then, with the tractography, identify where the fiber tracks are. So here is our map that we knew from ages ago where the average patient's motor cortex is. It's the red area. The blue area tends to be the sensory cortex, but the motor cortex, which is far more important in this setting, is the red area. By, um, uh, you know, just uh, on the side, the way the brain is mapped out by God is that the leg tends to be mapped out in the interhemispheric fissure right about here, and the hand and arm tends to be here, and the face and mouth tend to be over there. So with this information, we also know that there are fiber tracks coming down from the cortical surface, from the motor cortex, down through the, into the depths of the brain, going into the brain stem and down into our spinal cords. And these fiber tracks are called the corticospinal tracks because they go from the top of the cortex to the spinal cord. And here we could have a tumor near the motor cortex and have a resection Unfortunately, from our knowledge base, we could tell that this tumor is relatively far away from the motor cortex about here, and I'll show you how we do that. And we have a, a trajectory right through the shortest route from an area in front of the motor cortex into the tumor. And you can see a side view of this where the dark hole is where the tumor was resected. And this is a front view, seeing where the tumor was resected. <coughs> but let me show you how we do this preoperatively, and especially with this type of a patient who has a tumor that's coming very close, if not knocking on the door and partially invading the motor cortex. This is a patient whose tumor is white. And here we have a functional MRI scanning technique that shows that in this mapping, the tumor is seen as dark, and the motor cortex is right here. And you can see that this 
sulcus divides the premotor cortex to the motor cortex, and you can see that this tumor is partially invading the motor cortex. But most of the motor cortex is still activating very well despite the presence of the tumor there. Now I'm going to try this again. Let's see if it'll work. Nope. It's not working. So what I'm going to do is try to exit this again. And we create our map of the motor cortex in relationship to the tumor. Oh, you know something? This is not going to play as well as I would like. So I'm going to eliminate this one and go back to our talk. Interesting. Here's our talk. Unfortunately, uh, with a different computer, these videos don't always go as well as I would like. However, so we're going through the uh, occipital lobes into the motor cortex. And here, in addition to mapping out the motor cortex on the surface of the brain with the effort of functional MRI scanning like I showed you here where it maps out in yellow there. We also at the time of the surgery could map out the motor cortex with our neurophysiological colleagues who come into the operating room to add belts and suspenders to be absolutely sure that we know where the motor cortex is before we invade the brain in any way, shape, or form. So what we do is we place a grid of electrodes on the surface of the brain, and with our neurologists and neurophysiologists, we then, with the help of some oscilloscopes and special equipment similar to EEGs, we then map out where the motor cortex is, and of interest, when in this type of setting, where the squiggles in response to the stimulation on the surface of the, of the uh, brain response to sensory input from the arms and legs, when it's going in the same direction, and then turns directions where they face each other, instead of going in the same directions where they face each other, this is an indication that we know exactly where the sensory cortex is, and then we place the motor cortex, one gyrus in front, and we know exactly where the motor cortex is. We then take a small a bipolar electrode and stimulate the motor cortex itself and measure the electromyographic twitches of the muscles in the arms and legs, called EMG, to double confirm. So we use belts and suspenders whenever we're operating near the motor cortex in an effort to make absolutely sure that we can approach the tumor safely from a trajectory that makes sense for the patient. So here's the mapping. With the MRI scan of the navigation systems, we know that the tumor is sitting right here, right to there, and here's the motor cortex. Here's a closer view where you see tumor and motor cortex. And here's a resection that we're able to do, uh, perform to remove the tumor because the mapping showed us that indeed the tumor was outside of the motor cortex enough. Now when the tumor invades the motor cortex a little bit like it did in this patient, sometimes we develop some problems, but it works out usually for the best. Um, and we deal with it slowly but surely, and we see patients have a minor degree of weakness that gets better over a few months. But we have to weigh the balances with each individual and talk to them about the risks and benefits of staying out of the motor cortex and taking out only 90% of the tumor versus taking out that little bit of tumor in the motor cortex and what risks that might mean for them and help the patient and the family decide how much of a risk taker are they willing to take in this kind of situation. And with a well-educated patient and family, we respect their decision to choose how much of a 
goal for tumor resection we will want. Now, when the motor cortex is involved, that's pretty straightforward with weakness, but it's that supplementary motor cortex that can be very difficult to predict how well the function would be after surgery when you have a tumor that's sitting in the midline. The motor cortex maps out to here, and right here, the tumor is in the supplementary motor cortex along the midline. You can sort of see the tumor here, but that's not quite as easy as when the tumor is shown in the right hand of the slide that shows it as white. So when we look at the supplementary motor cortex, we can ask patients in the MRI scan with functional MRI scanning techniques to perform goal-oriented behaviors, like show us how you brush your teeth. That's one of our favorites. Um, or how you comb your hair, but when you're in the MRI scanner, it's easier to show how you brush your teeth than comb your hair. Uh, and my colleagues in the MRI scan and, and neuropsychologists that help do this are uh, very good at figuring out what works and what doesn't. Um, but here you'll see that this is a tumor that's coming close to the supplementary motor cortex on that side of the tumor. But when we ask them to perform goal-oriented behavior, it activates on the other side. And we found, find that both sides of the brain, the supplementary motor cortex, shares the responsibility for organizing goal-oriented behavior. And sometimes patients have that balance between the right and the left different so that you might have a dominant right side or a dominant left side whereby if you have the tumor next to the dominant side, it tends to cause an apraxia after surgery, whereas if the tumor is opposite to the dominant supplementary motor cortex, then you could proceed with the surgery with very little risk of an apraxia after surgery. And this type of a process helps us, before surgery, give the patient and their family the information they need to know of what to expect after surgery if you ask the surgeon to perform as much of a resection of the tumor as possible in the area where the supplementary motor cortex might lie. And here's a patient who had an apraxia, who had a dense left hemiparesis with good tone, and on day four started to move the arm and the leg much better and became normal three months later. Um, these kind of processes could be predicted before the operation to help. And we can also predict when an operation would cause permanent paralysis or permanent difficulties with neurological deficits. So patients could say, nope, I'm not willing to get, uh, get a better resection and pay for it with that kind of a deficit. Therefore. I want only a limited resection, or they might say, I want a different treatment and no thank you to surgery. And these, this kind of information before the operation is very helpful for patients and families. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about those deep fiber tracks from the motor cortex system, the corticospinal tracks, to get an idea of whether or not a tumor like this, which is very large and goes deep, is going to have a problem with a resection of this corner of the tumor because the corticospinal tracts coming down may be going through this portion of the tumor. If the tumor is invading the corticospinal tracts and I remove that part of the tumor, I may wind up having difficulty injuring the corticospinal tracts and having a patient have an unwanted weakness on the opposite side of the body. So, Preoperatively, we plan it by looking at the tractography. Here's a resection that occurred thanks to this motor cortex corticospinal tract ma mapping where we could see, and I'll show you, the blue corticospinal tract being bowed backwards a bit from the tumor but having a little margin between the tumor and the corticospinal tracts enough to be able to help have the resection with limited uh, risks to the patient, so they were able to have that resection 
And you could see again the corticospinal tracts being pushed back um, by that. So they were able to have this type of a, of a resection. Sometimes, however, as you can see, I'm a little chicken and I leave a little bit of the tumor in that corner because this patient and I said, I, you know, if I take it all out, I run a risk of such and such. If I leave a little there, that risk goes down. And this patient asked me to be a little bit more conservative. What we also do at the time, which is helpful, is that same little lecture that we can stimulate the surface of the brain that enables us to identify where the eloquent cortex is, we can stimulate in the depths of our resection, looking to see whether or not we can activate the corticospinal tracts going down with a certain threshold. And that information helps us to be able to tell us if, if the threshold for activating the corticospinal tract is starting to get lower and lower, we're getting closer and closer to those fiber tracts, and that tells us another bit of information to help keep us away from the no-fly zone, so to speak. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. I'm sorry, this one or this one? Yes. Um, this was a glioblastoma multiforme. And he's asked a question about pathology because what we tend to find is that the majority of the glial based tumors being glioblastoma multiforme or anaplastic astrocytomas or regular astrocytomas, um, they infiltrate the brain, but a tumor called an oligodendroglioma tends to infiltrate the brain even more. And luckily, um, this patient had a uh, glioblastoma multiforme. It wasn't infiltrating the motor, motor fiber tracts quite as much. Okay, now I'm going to talk about speech centers to wrap this up because speech and language, how we are able to understand people speaking to us, how we're able to formulate our language to talk and express ourselves, to communicate to others around us is very important. And in addition to all this technology that we've described for these other areas of the brain, we also have the ability to perform awake craniotomies where we could actually have a patient talk to us and read things and tell us the names of objects that they see pictures of in order to see whether or not when we stimulate areas like here and here, whether or not that stimulation would disrupt their ability to perform those language, um, language functions. And it's Wilder Penfield who really put this type of stimulation on the map with the weight patients showing where the speech and language centers were in order to help resect areas of the brain that were stricken with seizures to be able to stop seizures from occurring, but to do so without injuring their patient's ability to speak and understand people speaking to them. And so we find that this area of the brain towards the back, here's the front and here's the back, here's the top and the bottom, that this area of the brain is much more involved with the ability to process language and understand it. Our comprehension, our naming ability, our ability to read and write is there. Understanding how to read as well as hearing language is processed there. Whereas this area tends to be much more involved with the production of speech and language. So if you have an injury to this area, you may have a patient who understands you but can't say anything, maybe mute. Whereas you could have a patient with an injury here who could speak, but they don't understand you. And they may not understand themselves, so when they speak, they're going to speak in language that's a little confusing at times. So here we have, again, the calcarine cortex. And if a person is reading, the calcarine cortex will see a letter, they'll put it into letters and words in the association cortex, 
send it to the Angular Gyrus where it puts it into words and sentences, and then sends it to a speech center where it comprehends what those sentences are, and a fiber track sends it to the speech output center, which says what they're saying. So if you're reading out loud, you use all those circuits with the connections in between. And so if you have a tumor like this, the safest way is not going to be right through those speech centers and the connections between them. It's going to be to find a way to get into this tumor, maybe at a longer route, longer trajectory, but a safer trajectory to spare the language function that we map out over here. And so we can get a resection like this coming down low underneath the language centers which you saw were sitting up a little bit higher. So if a tumor is underneath the language center, underneath deep, we could go in underneath an angle in a way to get to the tumor without injuring the surface of the brain there. And next we have to find out where those fiber tracks connecting these speech and language functions are to be able to make sure we don't injure them in the depths of our brain resections also. Here's a tumor coming in underneath the language centers from in front. This is a low grade glioma coming in from in front and we're able to come in from this angle and spare the Wernicke's, the language comprehension area and the angular gyrus for reading and writing is in that manner. And here is another example of it by resecting with a forward approach from in front into it, resecting it and sparing the cortical surface that has the elephant cortex. And here you can see even coming into it, sparing it here. Now I have found that when I'm undercutting the language centers in a patient with a metastatic tumor that's going to be pushing the fiber tracks connecting the centers with each other, that I could go within about five millimeters from the surface of the brain underneath it and because the metastatic tumor pushes those fiber tracks ahead of it. But if it's a glioma that infiltrates, I tend to find that if I go closer than one centimeter to the surface underneath, that I'm going to injure the function of the speech and language center. And therefore, I give myself a no-fly zone of 10 millimeters if it's a glioma. So this is the kind of resections that we're able to have, sparing the functioning brain that's sitting up here going deep into it, again, mapping it out. And sometimes we have to map it out with a patient awake to make actual, absolutely sure when the tumor invades the cortical surface itself. But if it invades the depths underneath the language centers, we don't have to have them awake. And here's a good example of a tumor that's a small tumor. Seems like it should be easy to remove, but how close is it to the language function? And here's a good example of a functional MRI scan showing that there were areas of activation low down that were surprising to us because most of the time we think of the activation of comprehension up here. And we saw that the tumor was sitting here right next door to an activated center. And so we had to describe to that patient the risks involved. And when it's on the cortical surface like that, we tend to find that you need about a sonometer away from the activation of the functional brain of the cortex to be able to safely avoid injuring it. So in other words, I told the patient that I would need to be about a sonometer, I would have to leave about a sonometer of the tumor here for fear that I would injure this function. Now this was an oligodendroglioma. Also interesting in a patient who had multiple sclerosis, um, but this was an oligo. And it was not an oligo in a plaque, it was an oligo by itself. Okay, and here's an example 
of undercutting the speech output center called Broca's area, where you have a tumor starting to invade in the cortical surface, but also underneath, and telling us that the speech output center is very close to there, and how much of this tumor can we remove, and using the functional MRI scanning and tractography, we have to uh, look at that and tell patients whether or not we could do it or not. And in this setting, this tumor here, we were able to do so, leaving this part of the output of the speech function to be able to help. And I'm going to show you how we do something like that um, with the additional information of the fiber tracks that connect the comprehension center to the speech output center. It's called the arcuate fasciculus, and here's a map of a squiggle that's activated by deep the tractography, DTI tractography, of the arcuate fasciculus between the two centers. And you could get a sense that this speech comprehension center is connected to the output center here with the arcuate fasciculus, and the tumor is sitting in here, and our analysis will have to be how close to the speech center is that? And here's a good view of the arcuate fasciculus going into the speech output center with a margin, a gap between the leading edge of the tumor and the fiber tracks of the arcuate fasciculus. So a bit of technology increases our ability to tell the patient, we think we could remove your tumor, stay out of the speech and language center, and you'll wake up being able to speak because of that gap between the purple arcuate fasciculus connecting the speech output center to the language comprehension center. That gap gives us that confidence. Now I'm going to show you what we do, if I can. Oh no, I have videos because we have the ability through our microscope during the time of the resection, we have the ability for us to be able to see the, the kind of images that I just showed you of the tract and of the tumor. Now is there a fellow here who knows this computer? Uh, these are regular um, video files that should be playable. And for some reason, it asks me to go through this process. So I'm going to say finish and hope that this is going to work. I think it is. Oh, no, it says it can't play the file. Excuse me? No, unfortunately, I didn't. Hmm. Yeah, well, be it as it may, let me describe it to you because I'm at the end of the talk just wanting to show these videos to take you to where we began to use the technology in the microscope around 2007 and 2008 and how it's very helpful. You could imagine that through the microscope I'm aiming at where the tumor is and I want to see where the information of the tumor is on, uh, through the microscope and I also want to see where the eloquent parts of the brain are through the microscope. So with that in mind, I want to be able to have this kind of information, all this information, but I'll show you an image that'll pertain to it. All righty, here we go. I want to have this information in my vision as I'm operating through the microscope. I don't want to 
stop what I'm doing, look to a computer monitor off to the side, and point a probe somewhere, and then see where it shows up on the computer monitor, and then go under the microscope and see where my probe was, and then operate. I want to have real-time information. So what I have with the microscope is exactly this. I can see this picture without even seeing the person. Or I can flip a button and I can see a picture that shows the resection margin and the patient without any information. Or I can flip a button and I see wireframe information of where the fiber tracks are and where a wireframe of where that is. Or I could flip a button and the wireframe puts color into it. So what I have for this type of, a, of information is similar to what you'd expect you would want to see in a high-tech fighter pilot who has a visor over his head who doesn't have to take his eyes off of where he's flying to look at the instrument panel to know where a heat-seeking missile is coming from, which is the no-fly zone. And he could see off to the side on a panel where the target is, which is the goal to remove the tumor. He has it in his visor, and he has controls available on his hands to change the opacity of the target and the information that he sees ahead of himself through the windshield as well all the time without him having to distract himself to look at his instruments. And this is the type of technology that was enabled in about eight years ago, and we started using around 2006, 2007 here. Um, any questions right now? So, yes, sir. So, so this is the right thing very much. Um, Well, I don't know about you, but if you're in a new city and you're trying to go from point A to point B and you're going to take a subway in a subway you've never been to before, you want to have a map. You want to know how to get from point A to point B, especially if you have to change subway lines. So you want some information to be able to give you that you get on the blue train, go five exits, get off, get on the yellow train, go three exits, get off, and go upstairs to the, um, to the street level, and you walk three blocks south, and there you are at your destination. You know, you need that information. So GPS systems um, are of the most uh, critical importance when dealing with patients with brain tumors, obviously because it's critical to have that information to enable us to resect more of the tumor and to do so in a way that not only avoids further injury to the brain that was caused by the tumor to begin with, but also to be able to minimize some of the preoperative deficits that a person has had by debulking the tumor and sparing the functional brain cortical surface and sparing the fiber tracks for those important parts of the brain. Okay, ma'am, you had a question, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, you mentioned that the uh, yeah, all of those, that uh, it more. Yes, it tends to, but it's not always the rule. And sometimes we find that oligos can push tracks away. More often than not, oligos invade the tracks and GBMs tend to push tracks away a little bit more frequently, but a lot of times GBMs invade the tracks too. Metastatic tumors almost always push the tracks away, and so the pathology is very important in the analysis of risks and benefits, but it's the tractography for each individual patient before surgery that helps us really understand what the risks would be for each individual patient. Uh, titanium plates tend to be of minimal ferromagnetic character so that they cast very little artifact on MRI scanning. 
luckily. Um, some other fixation devices have a little bit more ferromagnetic uh, artifact, which are a little bit more difficult. Um, I like these cranial fixed plating systems that are two little parasols that come together and hold the bone plate in. Uh, so we t I tend to avoid those. But the titanium plates tend to have the minimal uh, artifact, and you could still do the, the fancy analysis with tractography and functional MRI with them in place. Uh, tractography and functional MRI scanning are just MRI scan techniques. Patients don't feel it. There's no side effects. Functional MRI requires some cooperation on the part of the patient, where tractography requires no cooperation. You could have a sleeping patient and get a very good tractography scan, whereas you need a patient with a functional MRI scan to activate a certain part of their brain to find out where their speech and language center would be as well as where their uh, um, motor cortex would be. Side effects from MRI scanning? No. Okay. Um, titanium plates do not have any side effects. The only thing that I have to admit is some patients with thin skin, if the titanium plates are not put in carefully enough, that could cause a little lump in the skin that could be a little annoying and sometimes could erode through the skin. So the titanium plates have a one millimeter um, kind of uh, uh, extent above the, the bone surface, and that's typically well tolerated without any problems. No side effects as far as that. Now they don't heat up in MRI scanners, and they don't set off airport <laughs> alarms. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, well, let me be fair and say that the standard for surgery is to remove as much tumor as possible with the least harm to the patient. My personal standard is to go one step further and to describe to patients and families what relative risks and benefits they would have from different surgical strategies. In other words, if, we, if I recommended to be conservative to all of my patients, I'd have no patients with new neurological deficits and I'd have patients with only 50% of their tumors removed. Whereas if we want to get above 90% of the tumor resection, we start to have to critically and analyze the risks involved, and this technology helps us before the surgery analyze the risks so that we're not surprised. I apologize for being specific, but is this something that is entertained by neurosurgeons in Ontario, Canada? Uh, well, I... Do you know if they participate? I could assure you from our neuro-oncology meetings as well as our neurosurgery meetings that in all universities there are people like me who have taken up the challenge to utilize technology like this as best as possible to maximize outcomes. So in most of the major cities in Canada, even though they don't have as as rich a uh, supply of neurosurgeons and technology as we have in the United States, but in the major universities of Canada, you have people who are just as good, if not better than me, working to help patients with brain tumors. Wilder Penfield, even though he grew up in Washington uh, State, he worked in Montreal, where he gained his reputation and won the Nobel uh, Prize for Medicine. Okay, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, yes, in fact, um, not only can metastatic tumors push fiber tracks away, but it can also push the local cortex away. So motor cortexes could be pushed uh, to uh, almost an inch away from where it would normally be. Uh, the hippocampus could be pushed potentially so that you can remove the tumor and spare the hippocampus. Um, that, that is true. So metastatic tumors have that kind of a benefit due to their structure. Um, 
glioblastoma multiformes could do that to a certain extent, but we don't know until we test the waters with the functional MRIs and tractography. Yes, ma'am. Could you tell me how common it is to have a cyst along with the GBM? Uh, it's variable. Oligos tend to have more cysts than GBMs, but uh, there could be some very cystic GBMs out there. Um, but the majority of GBMs are relatively solid unless they have a big uh, necrotic core that liquefies from the necrosis. Um, they tend to grow too fast to start making cysts where the oligos, especially lower grades, can have cysts. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for all your questions. <laughs>